so yeah, so thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks, Jason, for letting me present this. Uh, if nothing else, it's it's good practice. You know, makes me get this thing together sooner than I would have otherwise. So uh, the unit test strike back last year uh, at CPPCon, I gave a very strange talk, um, claiming that unit testing and experimental physics were kind of the same thing, and um, maybe that talk was successful. I'm not sure. But I got a lot of really good questions afterwards. And all the questions were, I've got some really hard or weird situation I'm trying to write a unit test for. How should I do this? And uh, most of the time, I didn't have any good comments other than to say, ooch, ow, yeah, ouch, that's hard, good luck. Um, so to whatever degree I can say anything useful about it, I thought I'd try and gather some good advice together about what to do when the unit testing situation is hard. Um, and, and to be clear, the, the general solution, the general answer to that is you're going to go do something really nasty. You're going to go break the rules that you've been that you've been given, and you're going to stop taking all the good advice. Um, so if we if we go back. Under ideal circumstances, what, what does a good unit test have? So the points I made last year, um, uh, from a science point of view, it's pretty much just the thing you'd like in an experimental setup in a lab. You want it to be precise, which is it tells you when something fails, it tells you very precisely what failed. You want it to be accurate, so it doesn't give you false alarms, uh, or it doesn't uh, say all your tests pass when your code's actually got a bug in it. You want your results to be reproducible, so you don't want flaky tests that fail every now and then just for no good reason. Um, and you want to calibrate your tests, which is basically that you occasionally spend time testing your testing framework itself to make sure that everything works. Um, but more generally, um, if you go read, if you go look at all the the uh, all the talks given at CPPCon and, and the other the other conferences. Last year, we had a whole sequence, a whole track on, on testing. Um, every year at CPPCon, there have been good tests or good talks on testing. There are blog posts, there are books. Um, this talk, I'm going to be stealing a lot from uh, our friend Michael Feathers here. Um, and so if you go listen to all those, uh, your list of things you'd like them to be are complete. Obviously, you want to test all your code. They should be maintainable. As you maintain your code, you should not have a huge maintenance burden to keep your unit tests working. They should be robust in the face of changing or maintenance on the code. They shouldn't break for no good reason. They have to be readable because you don't test your tests. The only way you know your tests are right is that someone read them closely. So they sort of need to be correct by inspection. And you might have regulatory or, or corporate policies, things they need to live up to. Okay. So that's all fine, but of course we have to remember the first thing, the zeroth thing, uh, because we're C and C++ programmers, is of course that they have to exist, right? Even bad tests that don't meet all these other criteria are much, much better than no test at all. Um, I have seen in my life one case where testing was probably of negative value, and I was in an extremely unfortunate situation. So um, this is all fine. But uh, what you do to get that is by following all the good advice that all the books and all the blogs and all the talks give you, which is like using test-driven development, uh, test using behavior-driven principles, uh, use only the public interface for your testing, which is what behavior-driven testing lets you do. You design for testability. If you can't test it, it's probably not a good design. And on and on and on, OK? So these are all the things you really want to do. but Generally, this is just plan A. And if it's successful, you don't need this talk. If you can do all these things, if you can drive, you know, build your tests first and design nice code and the designs always work out and it's always testable, then you're in great shape. This is where we want to be. All right. Um, and I realize I've got my cartoon on the wrong slide. So we'll come back to that. Uh, but of course, in real life, Real life doesn't go that nicely, OK? Um, this is a slide from my favorite online space opera, where our heroes are about to go off on a very poorly advised rescue mission. 
And so uh, th this, it occurred to me that this is exactly the right description for what really happens when you're up against it and you're trying to test something that isn't cooperating. Plan A is just ablative armor for plan B. And when that burns away, plan B takes a bullet for plan C, which is why we have more than three letters in the alphabet. Sometimes doing all this is hard. Sometimes test-driven development is hard. Sometimes behavior-driven development doesn't work out. Um, so this talk is about all the things that you have to do to make any kind of useful test, even when things aren't working right. Because any test is better than no test. And if your backup plan is just, I'm not going to test that, you need a better plan. So on the previous slide, that thing down at the bottom is when reality ablates your heat shield in a, in a, 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 a fiery blast of superheated gas, what are you going to do next? OK, and again, everything I'm going to tell you to do is actually really bad advice that you shouldn't take unless you don't have any better ideas, right? And you get together with colleagues and talk about it first because we're going to have to break the rules. So roughly speaking, th this also might be a little cheesier than I can get away with. You guys can tell me. Um, either the code is hard to test, the code is hard to test, or the code is hard to test. And so it's either that the code in and of itself makes testing difficult, or it might be that what the code does is fundamentally hard to test, or it might be that something about the test you have to do for it is difficult. So <clears throat> let's start with part one. Uh, the code itself is hard to test, by which I mean that what's hard is the code. Right, just for some reason, the code in and of itself is not cooperating, and you can't test it easily or at all. Which really is kind of legacy code. Um, this this part in particular, I'm borrowing a lot from uh, Michael Feathers, who is a very good book. Um, legacy code is the big obvious poster child for this. You've got code; it's 20 years old. It doesn't have any unit test. You're trying to figure out how to unit test, and you just can't. But you might get into this condition in other ways, but mostly legacy code. So you've got a class, and you'd like to test using black box methods, which is that you use only the public interface. And just because we need a stupid example, and it's slide code, and all examples in talks are stupid, let's start to write standard vector, OK? And so let's say that you've written standard vector, uh, but for whatever reason, you left out the capacity. Call. So you can't actually tell how much memory it's really got sitting underneath. The vector knows, right? You've got some private thing that tells you how big the memory chunk that you got is. But there's no way to test it from outside because you didn't put it in. And only after the fact do you realize that you can't unit test your whatever reallocation strategy and growing the vector and all that stuff. You can't test it because from outside you can't get to that information. So plan A would have been that you were doing test-driven development, and you noticed this during development, and you wouldn't have written this code if you knew you had to test it. But maybe you tried, but at the time you thought it wasn't a good idea. Maybe this is a, a implementation detail that at the time you thought wasn't a good thing to put in the interface. Or maybe you didn't write this code, it was added during maintenance, or it's legacy code, and it's kind of too late now. So plan A which is to follow all the good advice and never have any problems, has already dissolved into monatomic gas, right? Um, so plan B is the obvious thing. Just add the public accessor and test it, right? I mean, okay, it's after the fact, but let's just go add this thing that maybe should have been there in the first place, and then you're done, right? Plan B, easy. But plan B can fail too. Maybe this is hard to do. I mean, in this example, it's trivial, of course, but this is just a silly example for a talk. Uh, you know, something that I don't have to spend 20 minutes explaining to everybody. But this can be hard to do. Um, if this is hard to do, uh, like it, it really does degrade the encapsulation of the class, or it's exposing a lot of detail you don't want to expose, this may be symptomatic of some other design problems. But of course, you can't refactor to fix those other design problems until you have unit tests. And until you have unit tests, you can't fix those design problems, which is the problem you're always in with legacy code, 
right? You don't want to fix it unless you've got unit tests to tell you you're fixing it right. You can't fix it until you've got unit tests, and so you've got a nice little uh, infinite loop. Um, the other point is that maybe this really is a bad design. You're absolutely convinced that it's bad to put this in the public interface. Now, you're probably wrong. We all know that good code is testable, and testable code is good code. So yeah, probably you should do this. But maybe plan B doesn't work either. Maybe this is just really a bad idea. And it, before you, we abandon that and move to plan C, you always have to ask yourself, is this worse than the alternatives? Maybe it's a bad idea to put this in the public interface, but is it worse than whatever else you're going to do? All right, fine. Putting this in is a bad idea. Everybody thinks it's a bad idea. What's your next plan? Plan C, whoops, there we go, is that you try to refactor whatever this problematic thing is out of your class into another class. So in this case, for example, uh, we might pull the thing that actually just does the memory management and knows how to grow and shrink under certain circumstances. Maybe we refactor that out into another class, another separate class. You can put this down in your details namespace or something, but you pull it out into a separate class, that thing can now be unit tested independently. And so in your vector class, you just use one of those and you delegate to that. So your vector retains its encapsulation. You still don't have to provide a capacity member function, which apparently you don't want to do or you can't do. But at least you can unit test the behavior of the thing independently. Now, honestly, this might be better than plan B, right? Maybe it's this was telling you that you had a class that had two responsibilities. Single responsibility principle, right? The S in solid says that a class should only do one thing. Maybe your vector class shouldn't be memory, it's managing its memory. Maybe it should have some clever RAII thing under the hood that does that part of the vector. Who knows? But this is plan C, right? This, this might work. This is good. But maybe you can't do that either. Maybe refactoring that is just too hard to do. Later on, we'll get to a, a more concrete example of when you might really honestly not be able to do this. Um, so if you're up against it, you can't refactor it, or you don't want to because, again, you don't have any unit tests in place to tell you you're doing it right. What's your next option? So plan D is we have to do something even more ugly, right? which is that we go to a white box testing approach, and we abandon trying to test using only the public interface. We're going to reach into the guts, and we're just going to look to see that this capacity thing is doing what it should do. How do you do that? So what you do on line six there on the left is we have now changed private to protected. Um, can you guys see my little cursor? Yep, cool. OK, so there we go. We have changed this to protected from private. So now in your unit test code, which is this thing over here, you can inherit from the vector class. And since the thing that you're inheriting uh, can get access to the protected data, it can do something to open up those, that protected data. And you can look in there, and you can see what's really going on. So now you can use a VEC tester to call reserve on the thing and make sure that your capacity has done what it's supposed to do. Um, now, this weakens encapsulation. right? There might be very good reasons why you don't want capacity to be protected. right? We have public protected and private for good reasons. So that's not great. And you do have to go change the source code. But you can actually write your test. Okay, You can actually write a unit test to do what you need to do. Um, this has all the usual white box caveats. right? You have now coupled your unit testing code very, very tightly to your implementation. If you decide you have to go rename this mem member variable, you have to go change your unit test code. So you have greatly increased your maintenance burden as you maintain this code in the future. This is one of the big reasons why people don't like to go do white box testing. right? Your, your unit tests and your implementation are now tightly coupled. That's a bad thing. But again, we're already down to plan D. All your other better ideas and better options have failed. So maybe, maybe this is a good way to do things. Um, personally, I don't like the make it protected and inherit. I think this approach 
is more commonly used in more object-oriented languages like Smalltalk or Java or something. I think people reach for this. That's generally when I see this approach talked about, they're talking Java or, or something. Um, but if you don't like this, if you don't like breaking the encapsulation in your class, or maybe, maybe this thing is at the base of a big complicated inheritance hierarchy, and it's a really bad idea for that thing to be protected and not private, plan D fails. What do you do? You go to plan E, which is that if you break encapsulation, you do it in a better way. So now you have a trusted friend. So now what we're going to do is we keep everything private like we wanted it in the first place. And we just quietly down at the bottom of this class, no one's going to notice. We declare a friend class, which means that in our unit test framework, in our unit test test suite somewhere, we define the friend class. And of course, it can now reach in and get access to the innards. So you can write a class that gives you access to the inner guts of the thing you're trying to test. And you use that in your unit test. So typically, your VEC tester would take the vector that it's going to autopsy. Sure. It's going to autopsy a vector. So you give it that. It hangs on to that reference somehow internally, right? And so what you do down here in your test case is you make your vector and you do things to the vector. You make a VEC tester and you pass it in V. Now it's got a reference to V and can get into the guts and look. And now that you can query your testing class to see what's going on with the innards. And this has a couple of very nice things about it. So it doesn't affect the design of your class at all. You haven't really had to change your class, right? Which is nice because probably the reason you're down here in plan E is that you can't change it or you can't change it easily. Technically, this does break encapsulation, but not in a way that matters. At least I'm pretty sure. You will find people out there in the OO community who are convinced that friend classes are a, an abomination. Using one is always a code smell. They're a terrible idea. You should never do that. Why are you breaking encapsulation? No, whether they're right or not, there's a whole different discussion. In this case, I think that this actually gives you a nice way to reach into the guts and test your code. It's still a white box test. I like this better than plan D. If we go back to plan D, there we go. Plan D was making this protected and then inheriting from it. Maybe I, I like this better. Maybe that's just me. Um, as a C++ person who doesn't actually use huge amounts of object-oriented inheritance, I think this is a better way to go. And I don't think this is adding any security issues to your code. There is kind of a backdoor into vector, but all this public-private stuff anyway is just defending against uh, Murphy, not Machiavelli, right? I mean, if you've got a bad actor in your code base that can define public-private anyway and get in and do what they're going to do, well, that's what code reviews are for, right? Don't let them do that. <clears throat> so this is plan E. This probably, in most cases, well, in the few cases where you've actually gotten down to plan E and all the other stuff has already not worked, which is unlikely anyway, this is likely to give you what you need. But there are still cases where this doesn't work. If plan E ends up going down or it's gun jams or it runs out of ammo and you still are up against the wall, what do you do? You go to plan F, which is where you white box test in anger and you just give in and you define private public at the top of your unit test, all right? This is an act of desperation, right? Are, are we all clear that this is a bad idea? This is a bad idea, right? No one thinks this is good, okay? I mean. You're invoking undefined behavior just immediately, right? But again, we're down to plan F. You've had all these other things that are better plans that everyone likes better than this, and they haven't worked. So if you're really up against the wall, you can do this. And as horrible and nasty as this is, right? Like no one, no one is happy even seeing this on the screen. I have to admit, it's got two really good things going for it. One is that it requires absolutely no changes to your source code, zero changes, nothing at all. And it almost certainly works. Now, for, for reasons that are maybe, well, they're fairly arcane, at least back in earlier versions of GCC, this was pretty much guaranteed to work. I think Clang is too, because when the compiler is actually turning your code into object and making a library out of it, it doesn't 
encode the access privileges into the name mangling, which means that you could change name access or, or uh, access privileges after the fact, and everything will still link, right? Public private protected is only something it checks during compile time. The, I, I'm, it's undefined behavior, right? I'm just saying that it's the kind of undefined behavior that is almost certainly guaranteed to work the way you want it to. The only real downside I can see is that this might change the total set of things in your class that are available as an overload set, right? Like now something is public when it didn't used to be and somehow it's an, it's an option for an overload resolution. Okay, if, if, you're, if, if this class has a set of overloads and some are public and some are private, well, that's pretty ugly and it's pr probably unlikely, but maybe because you're already down in a very, very bad, unpleasant corner case of reality to begin with. But I have to admit it works. And let's just review what leads you to be in this situation is probably that you can't change the source code at all. Maybe there's legal issues. You're not allowed to. Um, I have worked on a project. It was a long time ago where the we were using a library furnished by the customer. And this was a library that was known to work. It had been used for decades to do something very difficult. And we were not allowed to touch it. No changes. Um, it might be uh, um, it's not your code to change. Maybe there's a company or a customer policy. Or, and this does happen, the source code isn't around anymore, right? How many people have worked on a project where you had a library or something or some algorithm for which the source code has been lost, but you need to keep using it? I, I actually, where I am now, I can't see if anyone's writing into the chat or anything. Um, this does happen. Project I was on until recently had a whole virtual machine's worth of executables for which no one had the source code anymore. And we needed to upgrade the compiler that was used to build some of the support libraries and that did not go well. Um, we handled it with a lot of very fancy footwork by basically setting a thing up and telling no one to even look at it the wrong way, right? Don't breathe on this damn thing. But this does happen. It's rare, but this does happen. And if the source code isn't available and you still need to write a unit test to expose a bug or something, you know, under these incredibly nasty or difficult situations, define public private is not your biggest problem, right? This is going to be the least sinful thing that gets done on this project to make things work, right? So I'm just saying it ain't your worst, it, it ain't your worst option. So let's try and summarize part one here, which is that the code is hard to test because the code is hard to test. Plan A is always avoid the situation test-driven development, behavior-driven, write good code, you don't have this problem, right? Everyone should be doing this. No one should be writing legacy code this week, right? Stop it. Um, plan B is fine, redesign it for testability and change the interface. If you can't do that, for whatever reason, you refactor that behavior out into a separate class, but you can't do that because it's hard to refactor. So then you go to your white box testing, which are those bottom three, which is changing the access to protected inheriting or add a friend tester class, or if your back's up against the wall, define private, public, and damn the torpedoes. Full speed ahead, I regret I have only one unit test to give for my country or something. There is, I suppose, a plan G, which we'll talk about here in a minute, which is that you abandon the unit testing completely. You rely on acceptance tests, system tests, and sanitizers, and cross your fingers and hope. Right? If you can't do any of those things, then it might be time to tell everyone at the CPP meetup you're looking for a job. I don't know. I don't know what your, what your options are at that point. Call that truck driving school. You saw the, the, the telephone number on your way into work and change jobs and, you know, I don't know. But anyway, that's part one. Okay, so we got down to plan G before we ran out of options. Um, no one's happy about anything other than plan A, but the reality is we've all been down in these other cases at one time or another. So at least you have some options. Anyway, before we go on, anybody want to have questions or comments about this so far? 
Uh, there has been just a few comments in okay. the chat. You said you you hadn't yeah, seen I them. Yeah, I can't see the chat at the moment. Yeah, Jacob is one of the people who said that he's encountered this, so I'll let him. <laughs> I, I do also have a question. Um, sure. Why do you recommend plan D before plan E when it sounds like you like plan E more? Um, <laughs> so I, I, I gave a very crude uh, version of this to my team this afternoon. They told me the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> The reason that plan D, which I don't like, is in before plan E, which I do like, is because I think plan D will fail before plan E does. And so if we're going in order of these things not working, I think plan E is less likely to work than plan D. Okay. Um, whoops, where are we? Here we go. Yeah, or plan D, right. So I think there's more cases where you don't want to change something from private to protected then there are cases where you're willing to add a tester class. Right. Um, if, if, you, if you're gonna line these up in the order in which they're going to fail under uh, the heat of reentry from orbit, um, I think E fails before D, or D fails before E. Mm -hmm. okay. But, um, and also I, I don't like it, but I think that's just partly me not liking Java and really liking C++ and thinking that object oriented is overused. And so I'm, I'm not sure I would, I, again, I think that plan E gets used more often in other languages. So I wanted to bring it up, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's, I, I'm, I'm willing to be convinced that plan, that, that, that uh, plan D is a better idea than I think it is. That might just be my opinion. Okay. Just curious. Yeah, that's a, uh, that is a very legitimate point. Very legitimate. <clears throat> I, I have a comment on that one too. Sure. Um, can you go back to it real quick? Oh, yeah. Da, da, da. Um, why are we even concerned about testing capacity when <laughs> it's not visible externally at all? So. Uh, right. So if, if you don't need to test this, then you were in plan A where all the good advice worked and you could test everything you needed to test with the public interface, and in which case you're done and you, you moved on. Um, the hypothesis is that maybe there's some complex internal logic that you would like to test in a unit test. Like I've just pushed back into a full vector and I'd like to make sure that it doubles in size because that's the algorithm I've decided on. Well, you'd but, like to be able to- but, but, my, I, but I guess my question is, why do you want to make sure of that? Like, if, if you, shouldn't you have, shouldn't that logic be encapsulated elsewhere other than in the vector class? Well, okay, so that's, um, that's plan C, right? Plan C is that, is to do exactly what you just said. That is a bit of logic that should be refactored out into some other class. And so if we refactor it out into a, a value array that it's a dynamically allocated array that gives you regular value semantics and it has some logic and that has visible accessors to see how big it is, uh, then, then you're absolutely right. This is, this is your plan. You refactor it out. You unit test that to make sure that your value array doodad does what you want it to do under certain circumstances. Then you can pull it into vector, and now you don't have to worry about whether vector is going to do the right thing when it changes its size because you know that value array has got that taken care of. So you're right. If you're in a position where you decide that vector shouldn't be making this aspect of its behavior visible, no one should care about it. No one should be asking what its, what its size is. But you still got a complex bit of business and you want to make sure it works. This is your plan, right? You, you, you do exactly what you just said. You're right. This is a much better idea. You pull it out into a separate thing. You can unit test that. If you don't want anybody else to see it, you put that down in your, in your details uh, subdirectory in some obscure namespace. But you can still unit test it, and then you can use it in vector. Yeah, it's You're following the single responsibility principle. Yeah, exactly, right. Um, if you can't do that, because maybe, again, refactoring it's hard or whatever, that's where you get into plan D, E, and F, and G, and horrible things happen. Uh, so there was uh, some other comments on the chat here about uh, if you rely on the fact that class is default private, 
then your hack of pound define private public isn't even an option. The conversation degraded very quickly from there. We were coming up with ideas. It wasn't yeah. degrading. <laughs> and by we, Jason means himself. Jacob rather means himself. Yes, yes Jacob is the one who, de- who, 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 yes. Look, define class or define, yeah, class struct. Yeah, define and then... class struct first. Yeah, right. I mean, it can only. Well, I'm thinking. If, if you're in a position where this is your best option. I claim that nothing you guys are writing in the chat is beyond the scope, is beyond the pale. Because again, I mean, I, I, people are in positions where there's some chunk, maybe it's part of your own code that your company has lost the source code for, but you still need to use that library because it's the only thing known to mankind that can interpret the, the, the file format that your entire company is relying on, right? It's like, you know, under those circumstances, Again, a bad, a, a bad option is worse than no, or is much, much better than no option at all, right? In all seriousness, though, uh, why not then just rely on acceptance tests instead of this kind of craziness? Yeah, well, again, you might decide that that's horrible and you don't want to do it. And yeah, so you go to acceptance tests and your system tests. Okay. Um, it just, I, I I, I have been in enough situations where the first three or five things I thought of turn out to not work. And you really want to have that last ditch option in your pocket just in case reality turns out to be less friendly than you would hope. You could always just copy the header file and transform the text within it too. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the situation I told you about, we were seriously for at least three days considering hitting this thing with a decompiler on the basis that we were pretty sure most of it was Fortran and maybe we could recompile it with another compiler. I, I, you know, I mean, we, we didn't go there, but you know, I mean, if that kind of option is on the table, I'll, I'll define private public before I rely on decompiling 70, 30 year old Fortran code and trying to deal with the results, right? I mean, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, part two, where the code is hard to test just because of what the code does. Um, and, and I think maybe I, I'll skip the second one or I'll just I'll go briefly through the second one. The first one I think is a legitimate thing because I've been here. You've got some huge thing, it's millions of lines of code and the front end to it is you're getting messages off a network connection or you're reading data in from a file and you've got some front end that is looking at this data and it's coming in and you're parsing it as messages. And then you have to dispatch to the right part of your code to deal with whatever the message is. So you've got some forever loop. Um, I mean, most of what my company does is data processing things that you typically start them and they're supposed to run forever, right? So you've got some you know, loop forever, pull the next thing off the socket, interpret it as whatever data type your message is, and then do something with it, handle the message. So uh, you get the message, you figure out what the type is by some, some means, and then you switch on the type. And if you get a camel message, you handle the camel message. If you get a horse, you handle the horse. If you get a rhino message, you handle the rhino message, right? So you've got this thing up front that is your dispatcher for deciding what input you just got and deciding what to do with it, right? Um, and the point is that unit testing this particular function could be extremely challenging because you need the whole rest of your thing there to run it, right? Your plan A might be to write mocks for your entire system and then write the unit test. It's expensive, but doable, but this is frequently a lousy return on investment. If you haven't already mocked or come up with some stub or some handy thing for all this stuff. That might take a lot of work and the return on investment isn't that big because honestly, how wrong could this code be? If you've done a decent job of writing the code so it's broken up like this, for example, if case camel were a hundred lines of logic to handle camels and then case horse is 70 lines to handle horse. Now that actually does need some unit testing but presuming that you can refactor it into something this nice how wrong can this really get? If you read this, 
and you get a rhino, but you handle a hippo, I think it's going to be obvious. So maybe plan B is just you read it and it's fine. That is a manual step. We'd all prefer automated testing. Plan C might be exactly uh, as we just talked about. You abandon the unit test and you rely on your system tests, right? Because honestly, if you've got a halfway decent system test, if you send in a rhino but handle a hippo, I think it's going to be pretty obvious that you've got a very, very wrong kind of four-legged large mammal on your hands and something's going to go wonky. So yeah, testing is a defense in depth, right? I mean, unit testing is just the first stage in testing. After that, you've got integration tests, you've got system tests, you've got all these other kinds of tests. In a case like this, where there isn't a heck of a lot to unit test in the first place, just going to a system test might be fine. It's cheap, you've already got one, and getting your unit test coverage to 100% by unit testing that just might not have much return on investment. So this is a case where, yeah, plan C is simply, I'm not going to unit test that, it's not worth the effort. That may fail in the face of regulatory statements where every, you know, every line of the unit test uh, or every line of your code must be unit tested and you have to prove it to people. But okay, but this, this is probably a not unreasonable plan C. Svetlana in the chat here has just pointed out three different ways that your four lines of code could in fact be wrong, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so plan A has now vaporized. Plan B is right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the, I, I had a big one of these where there were 20 different kinds of things. And yeah, we kind of wanted a unit test, but we looked at, I mean, honestly, if we could have, if we could have faked out or stubbed the rest of it, that's more work than just like letting it run. Basically, we, we'd be driving the whole system via a unit test. And it's hard to drive the whole system and make sure the right thing happened in a unit test. So uh, yeah, like we just, we just relied on the system test and said, that's fine. There's another case, and this is again, unlikely. I've seen it a couple of times and I don't want to dwell on it because honestly, this is kind of back in the stuff we've already talked about. But there are cases where you write a function in a class and it is single responsibility principle. It's a single bit of business but it's long, it's complex, and you just can't refactor the thing. Every time you try and break it up, it gets worse or it introduces unacceptable performance overhead. Again, there's the case where you can't change the source code, which we kind of already covered. Uh, and as an example, uh, this is something I worked on about 10, 12 years ago. Um, and we do not have to go through the mathematics involved in the Kalman filter. Anyone who's done Kalman filters has seen this before. Um, and this, by the way, is like the first half of it. And I copied this straight off of Wikipedia. Doing a Kalman filter is an enormous pile of linear algebra. And it's complicated linear algebra. And what I've got on the screen is about the first half of the simple version. And it actually gets much worse than this. Um, numerical stability is a problem. If you look down at the optimal Kalman gain there, at the very end, there's an S. My, where's my cursor? There we go. This, this little bit right there. This is a matrix inverse. And if you know linear algebra and you've really dealt with this, this is uh, famously a numerically unstable operation. You get a lot of round off error and stuff building up. So people who do this for a living, which I did a while back, go to great lengths to never actually do that. You don't actually take the matrix inverse. You do a whole pile of other kinds of linear algebra that involves basically walking around it, waiting until that matrix inverse isn't looking and then bopping it over the head with something. Um, this is a big, complicated pile of code. And it's almost always the case that you cannot run these fast enough, right? This is a very computationally intensive thing to do. So what we found when we were trying to break up a matrix, uh, a common filter implementation is that as we went through, we would save off little chunks of the comp computation to be used later because that would save time. So if you pulled any given part of this out and tried to make a separate method out of it, you had to pass 15 things into it, right? It was just a mess. Every time we tried to refactor it, it got worse. It was just a mess. Now, that was 10 or 15 years ago. I've learned a thing or two since then. I'd like to think I could do a better job of the refactoring now. But back then, we had a bunch of PhDs working on this, and none of us could figure out how to refactor this damn thing. And in particular, the problem is that we wanted to know what happened if, for example, 
that inverse does go wonky and something bad happens. Or if maybe this HK transform has got a particularly bad thing going on with it, we want to poke at an edge case. How do you do it? So we've actually seen a bunch of these. Like plan B is refactor for testability, but it didn't work for this code. We tried. Plan C is white box. Well, you still can't poke into just, you know, the 270th line of this and set a certain condition to be true and see what happens. Plan D, this is math. So in principle, you could work your way backwards out of all that and figure out exactly what uh, inputs to give this thing to poke at an edge case and to see what happens. That turns out to be extremely difficult to do, like extremely difficult to do. Um, not impossible, but difficult. So honestly, what we did was we abandoned the engineered testing uh, and we went to the equivalent of a, uh, the local equivalent of an acceptance test. Um, if you can deploy to the field, watch for this case to happen and grab the inputs that happen to trigger it, and then get that back into the shop and build a unit test based on that, you can do something with it. Or you can do the equivalent of fuzz testing where you rig it to just send random but valid data in and look for the things you want to test. Grab those and write your unit tests. This is not ideal either, right? This is a difficult situation, but every now and then, there are cases where you just can't refactor the damn thing and you have to go to something else. So some card is code is either hard to test or hard enough to test that it isn't worth the investment and there's a much easier option. So you either don't worry about the unit test, the system tests will be good enough or you have to do something fancy like just throw data at it until it fails and watch what happens. Very good with part two before I go on. Okay, good. Part three is really where I sort of started thinking about all this, where the code is hard to test. Um, this is also, by the way, the chunk of this that um, I've spent the, le the least time on the slides, so things might get a little grungy here. Um, the problem here is almost always that the code isn't hermetic. Uh, hermetic, go to Webster's, uh, airtight or impervious to external influence. Um, what this really means is that the code that you're trying to test is a network communications protocol, right? The reason it's there is to send data to something else. Or it hits a database, or it has to hit an external system, or a server to get something, or to do something, or it writes to the file system, or maybe it, it is a driver for custom hardware and you need the hardware around to actually exercise the code, right? So the point is, is that you've got bits that are entering and leaving your unit test executable in some way, shape, or form. And this is maybe the biggest problem in unit testing these days. Certainly people, after my talk last year, everybody was asking me how to handle this. Um, The reason this is bad, by the way, maybe it isn't obvious. I mean, and, and this can't be handled, but the point is that you want your unit test to fail because the, low, the, the code that you're testing fails, right? The logic is wrong, the code is wrong, and for no other reason. If it fails for some other reason, you've got false alarms happening. You've got at the best flaky tests, and at worst, you've got a sudden failure for some reason that no one understands, and you're going to have to delay a shipping an important delivery or you're going to miss a deadline or something because you're tracking down a failure in something that risen, it wasn't really your code. It was some other thing that failed. Um, now, the other problems are that these tend to tie your development environment to that external system. And maybe there's only so much hardware you've got and you have to dedicate some of your scarce resource, uh, uh, your scar scarce hardware resources to just sitting around waiting for your CI pipeline to use it, right? Uh, or if you don't do that, again, you get flaky tests where things fail for reasons that have nothing to do with your code and it wastes time and resources tracking that down. So um, this is a problem. Um, so the first thing to do is, b before you do anything else, is to return the, reduce the non- Non-hermicity is a hard thing to say after a long day and it's 6.30 at night. Non-hermeticity, reduce it 
if nothing else, just try to put it all in one place so there's only two or three calls you've got in your code base that actually go out and hit the thing, as opposed to it being spread everywhere. That's probably just a good refactoring step anyway. But make sure you do that first just to make your life easier with everything else that's going to happen. Um, but taking that as red, uh, now you pick your poison. So A, plan A is you uh, fake the hermeticity with mocks. Um, so we all know what mocks are. Um, there were supposed to be some links on this page. Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Peter Summerlad gave a talk called uh, Mocking Considered or Test Doubles Considered Harmful. Um, I think just earlier this summer, uh, Chris Jusiak gave a talk on um, dependency injection, which is basically a way to be able to use mocks. I think he gave that at CPP now. I hope hopefully those links show up. Um, doubles, fakes, mocks, they're all kind of the same. Oh, okay. I guess the, 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 the links will show up in a minute. Um, you do this when the real objects are non-deterministic or they're hard to set up or the behavior you want to trigger in your unit test is hard to trigger, or they're slow, or they don't exist yet. There's a lot of reasons you might like to use mocks in general. And mocks are typically the first option for dealing with an external system that your unit tests, uh, the code you're trying to unit test is going to go out and hit. But they do have, yeah, here we go. Um, they do have downside. It takes time to make them. Um, uh, Here, Professor Semerlad was talking about how difficult mocking frameworks are to use. Mocking frameworks are kind of strange, complex, weird things. Um, your mocks typically need independent testing in and of themselves. The fact that your code works with a mock is not a good reason to assume that your mocking code works. You need to go make sure that does what it's supposed to do first, right? They're hard to hook in. That's what Chris was talking about. Uh, earlier this year. They're also unrealistic. Um, I like the joke that uh, Titus Winters and Hiram Wright made back in 2015 when they were talking about this. If in order to test your code, you have to have the whole earth uh, and the earth is hard to make, right? We hear it takes days to get one of those set up and running properly. So you come up with a mock earth to run your code in, but your mock earth, which is simpler than the real earth is flat, which means you're testing all your code with a flat earth right? And depending on what your code's doing, this might work out great, or this might lead to some very, very difficult uh, problems down the road. They can just mask problems. They're kind of problematic. So if you don't like mocks, or you can't use a mock, you can't figure out a way to wire a mock into your code, whatever, um, plan B is to kind of embrace the non-hermeticity and just deal with it. Uh, but what you might like to do is whatever this external system is, you just make it ubiquitous and local and reliable. Um, if it's a service, um, just have that service running all the time on your development environment and in your testing framework and in your CI pipeline, it's just there, right? It's all over the place. You fold that in all, into all your build environments and maybe you invest in whatever dedicated resources you need to make that happen. But the idea is that if it's, all, always available, it's just everywhere. You can assume it's gonna be there. You can get on with using it. So for example, some people worry a lot about a unit test that's gonna hit the file system. Chances are you've got a file system, right? I mean, most, most development environments are gonna have a file system. So the fact that you're depending on the file system to exist and have space on it is maybe not such a big problem, right? Maybe you just assume that that's good and, and you go with it. It's very unlikely to fail. Um, but there are cases where you really can't do that. The thing is fundamentally non-local, expensive, hard to get to, whatever. It's a limited resource. So maybe, maybe the real system works with a big, expensive, huge, complicated online server of some description. And so for your testing, you've got a test server set up. But even then, that's a big complicated thing that takes a lot of hardware and you have to devote IT resources to keeping it alive and happy and well-fed. Um, uh, or maybe it's limited in the sense that this thing, you're, you're actually talking to hardware and there's only so many instances of the hardware you can afford to build and just have floating around the office 
for people to run unit tests on. They, I mean, if, if the thing you're trying to hit is a $200,000 piece of robotic equipment, you can't have 20 of those floating around to run every time someone wants to run a unit test. Despite, and of course, you've got the other problem if someone runs a unit test and all of a sudden something starts moving, right? You know, right? The robots are going to take over eventually. But it could also be that this is only available from certain locations, right? The $200,000 robot is not hooked up to the internet. And if you're working remotely, there might be some very realistic limitations on your ability to get to the thing to run a unit test. Um, so now your tests are depending on a limited, possibly unreliable resource in order to even do anything. And so now what do you do? Um, the answers are, that, by the way, this is where my slides run out. So um, the answer is, well, maybe you just deal with it, OK? The, the, the problem is that you run a unit test, and the thing is down. The server's down. The network connection's bad. The robot has decided to go have a coffee, whatever it is. Um, if that doesn't happen very often, maybe you're good. Every now and then, you have a whole slew of unit test failures. But it's going to be pretty obvious that the unit tests that are failing are all the unit tests that needed to hit the database. And you just happen to know that this always happens at Friday at 6 o'clock because that's when the database goes down for maintenance. Uh, or it always happens at 2 in the morning because that's when your, your janitors unplug the robot because they need to plug in their, their vacuum cleaners, right? OK, it's annoying. It's non-deterministic. OK, fine. There are, there are worse things in the world. Um, but if you don't like that, and most people don't like having a whole slew of unit test failures at random times, what you might consider doing is set up a sensor, an independent doodad, that's just there to tell you and your unit test framework if the thing is available. This is something that basically acts as a check that your unit tests, system tests, whatever, can hit before they proceed to see, is there any point in us doing this? Because if the thing is down or we can't get to it, this isn't going to work anyway. So you check your sensor first. Now, if you've been paying attention to recent attempts to launch certain things into orbit, um, AKA Boeing's latest attempt to do this, where they rolled it out to the pad and they got a whole slew of, of sensor uh, failures. Hey, we can't do the thing. And if you remember back to the space shuttle, for example, they were always scrubbing launches because of a sensor failure. Right, but that's better than launching and having something bad happen. We we've, we've seen what happens with that too. So okay, Boeing Starliner has a bunch of sensor failures. They roll it back in, and maybe it isn't a sensor failure. Um, you can occasionally have problems if your sensor isn't working right and incorrectly tells you whether your database is up or not. Okay, so your sensor needs to have its own set of test cases, but you can do that. Um, but you're at least now in a situation that it is very unlikely that the sensor will fail in such a way that your unit tests try to run and then they fail because the thing isn't there. I think that the, the other challenge that you have to deal with under this kind of situation where the thing you need to run your tests isn't there, and you, now you can detest that, so you're not going to get a bunch of, of uh, false alarms. The thing will tell you, hey, I couldn't run these tests, is how do you handle the case where you can't run all your unit tests because the thing wasn't there, right? In a typical workflow, the unit tests have to pass before you can check it in or before you can merge to the dev branch or before you can roll your build or whatever. And what do you do if the answer from your tests come back neither positive nor negative, but try again later? Um, so that's going to take some thought with your uh, your agile people or your your process people to figure out how to handle that case, but at least you're not trying to reach out to your to your database or your test server, run a bunch of tests that absolutely require that thing to be there. It isn't there. They fail. Your build fails. Everything turns red, and people are panicking because you've got some kind of test or system failure for a reason that isn't because of your code. I think that's plan, I don't know where we are, maybe plan D at, uh, under these circumstances where you've got to deal with this external thing. You can't mock it. You can't fake it. You can't have 70 of them. You can't put one in your development environment. The best you can do is you have one out there for all of your testers to get to 
And if they can't get to it, at least you know a priori that you can't run the tests or that you should neglect the result of those tests because the thing isn't there. That's the best I can do. Uh, and uh, without having a great end slide yet, I'm working on it. Uh, going way back up here. There we are. The general point is that you've got all these options for doing what you need to do to write the tests you want to write. And in an ideal world, you just follow all the best practices everybody has been telling you about, and you don't have any of these problems. But reality is that occasionally some in incandescent burst of plasma hits plan A and it vaporizes, and plan B goes down, and plan C goes down, and plan D goes down. When the reality of dealing with hard situations in our code rear their ugly heads and all these other things, all the good advice doesn't work, you have to go to the bad advice. And all I can hope is that at least some advice is worse than others. And hopefully, hopefully some not as bad as others advice gets you out of the current situation before you have to resort to something really unpleasant. Thanks. And hey, it actually came in at slightly under a full hour. So we've actually technically got four minutes for, for discussion. Um, now that I'm not sharing, let me see if I, I, got, I got to go find out what you guys have been putting in the chat here. Yeah, you should check that out. And of course, anyone who wants to, you, you can unmute yeah. yourself and ask questions. So break can be missing. It, it was because, of course, I'm trying to get it all to fit on a slide, which is always a fun thing to do. I've been looking back, by the way, I looked at some of Jason's earlier talks and he gets away with this by never putting up an example that's more than three lines of code. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I learned from the master. <laughs> yeah, define class class, define capital C class. Yeah, I know, yeah, oof, ouch. <laughs> yeah, again, I mean, I really did have a conversation with representatives of my customer about, could you take this thing that probably was compiled on two versions of the operating system older than what we're running it on now? And there's no good reason for us to think it even works now, but it does because it's been doing it for a year. Can, could you find a decompiler? Could you, first of all, figure out what the hell language it was written in? decompile it and get anywhere with that. Under those circumstances, I will define class struct in a heartbeat before I deal with decompiling probably Fortran code written in the 70s, right? Like nothing good is going to come. I, I don't know how many other people have actually dealt with Fortran code written in the 70s. <laughs> um, I, I spent a short period of time doing this. And I can tell you that there, there are variants of Fortran out there where you can call a function with an offset. So I want to call the square root function, but I want you to start four lines of code in, right? And when you return from the function, the return statement can have an offset, which means I want you to return from this function, but under certain conditions, I want you to return over there instead, right? I mean, I, I have seen this code. And I started to complain about it and then realized the guy sitting three rows down was the guy who had written it back in the late seventies. And I had to apologize because it's like, dude, I'm sure. I mean, it, the thing worked, right? As well, it did at the time. Yeah, um, I've, I've been there. So again, you think all oh, this is crazy, but this stuff happens out there. Uh, let's see, uh, a flaky test is worse than no test. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you, someone, someone loved it. I love common filters. Uh, Break can be missing. Let's see, what else did I miss here? Um, I love mocks. I also hate how long they are to create. We created a mock not that long ago for something. We had to mock Zookeeper. Um, I don't know if you guys have used uh, Apache Zookeeper is a kind of a simple, basic, but very resilient distributed database doodad. And, and we did, we, we mocked it. Um, it wasn't easy. We basically copied the header file and then wrote our implementation of it. Yeah, they're a pain, they work, but. Uh, easiest, fast, simplest test framework. Um, 
Yeah, J catch two or a doc test. Um, I am a huge fan of catch. Uh, we'll catch two. I am probably going to get into trouble with my company because the rest of my company uses Google test. And um, and I used catch because I wanted to poke at that. Um, and for those of you who, I mean, he's given several talks on it. Chris Jusiak, uh, I don't, does anyone know, is that, is, is that the right name, way to pronounce his last name? It's as close as I've gotten. He's got a catch two ish thing built with no macros using C 20, and it is mind blowing. And uh, every time I meet him, I shake his hand because he's better at this than I am. That's all I can say. Yeah, there it is. Google test is not bad, by the way. I like Google test. It is more mature than catch. It has more stuff in it, but catch is more elegant. That's just me. I don't know. And thank, thank you for all the feedback, guys. This is absolutely going into this as I tune this up. Um, again, ho I'm hoping this goes into CPPCon. Um, although if it doesn't, I'll be happy on the basis that that just means there's a lot of good talks. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll be tuning this up. Thank you. Uh, all, the, all the feedback is good. Kind of looks like we're at the natural end of questions. So, yeah. uh, I mean, of course, we always hang out and chat for a little bit longer. I just wanted to thank you again and and stop the recording in a oh, second. Oh, sure. Here. Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, one, one, more, one more comment on oh, sure. Chris Jusiak. He also has a library that integrates with Google Test to automatically generate mocks. Yeah. So you can have it like generate all the mocks for you without having to write anything. Yeah. So um, there was somebody guessing, complaining about how long it takes to write mocks. Well, if you use Google yeah. test, you can use that. I can put the link in the chat too. Please, please do. I want it. And I'm guessing just because of he's Chris that that's a C++ 17 or 20 thing. We just moved to C++ 20 on the project I'm on. We're oh. very happy with that. So um, that means we could actually use something that Chris wrote. Uh, it's not, I believe it's C++ 11. It might be 14. <laughs> Chris is a much, much, much better programmer than I am. 